The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So any questions from last time? We started doing <coughs> reaction mechanisms. We did um, first order parallel reactions. So one of the things that we'll be stressing is that the mechanisms that we write down are ways to try to understand a complicated chemical process. And um, you take data, you get, you can find intermediates sometimes, and uh, you get rate laws from the data. You, you infer rate laws, and from these rate laws you think up of a reaction mechanism, and you make sure that what you measure is consistent with your mechanism that you make up to explain a complicated chemical process. And one really important thing to remember is that when you come up with a mechanism and you've got a bunch of data that supports it, it's great, but it doesn't mean that you've solved the problem. It doesn't mean that you've proven that the way that the chemistry proceeds is really the way it proceeds, because there's always the possibility that there's an intermediate somewhere in there that you haven't been able to measure. And a lot of people get tripped up over the course of the last century of making up mechanisms, getting a lot of data that supports the mechanism, and missing something really important. Um, so it's a, it's a common mistake that people think that they've proven a particular chemical uh, mechanism just because they have data that supports it. It's up to a certain point that you know what you, what you have. And we'll see examples of that um, today, probably, and then certainly next time when we start making approximations in our kinetics and see where things can really go wrong if you don't have enough data, if you don't try to fish out really, really tiny intermediates somewhere along the way. OK, so last time we did then parallel first order reactions. And today we're going to march through and do um, parallel first and second order. So one is first order, the other one is second order. Things are going to get more complicated. And what you're going to get is a flavor of how to solve the problems, right? setting up the problems. We're not going to do a lot of the algebra here on the board, because otherwise we would spend the next three weeks doing algebra. And that would be no fun at all. Right? That doesn't mean that you're not going to be doing any algebra on the homework, because part of it is, is figuring out how to do it. OK, so um, we have our reaction where A goes to B plus C. And the first thing we did was the first mechanism we wrote was a parallel mechanism where we have A goes to B and A goes to C. So that's the mechanism. And one other way to write it is A goes to B or C in a way that is more um, it sort of describes the branching process that when we talk about a branching ratio, the ratio of, of the amount of B to C, uh, this looks like the branching out of two different paths. And this time we're going to do where this was first order and this is second order with array K1 and array K2. And the way that you do all these problems, you have to be very systematic about it. Um, the first thing you do is you have to write down all your rate laws and make sure that you include everything. So you start by writing the rate law for the destruction of A and then the rate law for the appearance of B and for C. So for A, we have dA, dt. And again, I'm dropping the brackets around the A because I don't want to carry around all these extra symbols. So we destroy A through uh, by making B. So that's going to be first order. And then we also destroy A by making C, and that's second order. So we have two paths out of A uh, to get rid of A. Then we write down the appearance of B. 
dB dt, it's only through one path, first order in A, and then the appearance of C, only one path, which is second order in A. And these are all our differential equations. And now the, the trick is how do you solve these three differential equations in a way that you get meaningful information out. Okay. Well, the first thing to do is to, um, so these two here depend on A, right? This one, uh, so the appearance of B depends on A, the appearance of C depends on A, but this one here only depends on A by itself. So this is the first one you're going to start out with because you can put all of the A's on one side and all the time on the other side and integrate. So then you solve. And uh, you can rewrite this as minus dA dt is equal to k1 times a times 1 plus k2 over k1 times a. And then you put all the a's on one side, all the t's on the other side, and integrate from a0 to a minus dA over a times 1 plus k2 over k1 times a is equal to k1 from 0 to t dt. And then you have to solve this, this integral here. And there's a reason why I factored out the a here. It's because this is of the form you can use to use the trick of partial fractions, which we mentioned <coughs> once before. Right? So you use partial fractions to solve this. And I'm not going to do it on the board. You turn the crank, you basically you write 1 over a times 1 plus k2 over k1a is equal to n1 over a plus n2 over this part here. And you solve for n1 and n2, and you plug it back in, and you redo your integral, et cetera. And you get your answer, which I'm going to write down because I'm going to use it um, later. k1 a0 over e to the k1 times t k1 plus k2a0. So one of the things you immediately see is even though this mechanism isn't very complicated, just two paths, one first order, one second order, the uh, solutions start to get not so simple pretty quickly. Okay, so it depends. There's an exponential on the bottom here. It depends on the initial concentrations, and both rate constants are in there. The first thing you want to do is you want to look at limiting cases. Okay, Just like before, um, we did. And um, the first limiting case we're going to look at, uh, so an interesting thing to look at is, is, is this guy right here, k1 and k2a here. If one is bigger than the other, then things will, will um, cancel out, and uh, we can get some intuition. So the first limiting case we're going to look at is where k2a0, this term right here, is much smaller than k1. Okay. Now we want to make sure that in these limiting cases that uh, when I write something like this, that the units actually make sense, that I'm not saying you know, three apples are less than four oranges. Right? So k1, uh, it's first order, so the units are 1 over second. K2, it's a second order rate constant, so the units are 1 over second molar times moles per liter. So the moles per liters cancel out, and I have 1 over second is less than 1 over second. So things are great. Okay. I'm making the right kind of approximation here. What else is this approximation saying? This is saying that the rate into B, so this one is the faster one, K1, the rate into B is the rate into is K1, is faster than um, k2 times a, which is basically the rate into c. Okay. So this is saying that the rate into b to form b is faster than into c. So we can write down a, a sketch. We can sketch what we expect this approximation to, to be then. Okay, we know it's going to look something like this. 
we know that A is going to come down exponentially okay, without any structure to it. It's going to go either into B or into C in some branching fraction. And we know that the rate into B is faster than it into C, so B is going to come up like this, and C is going to come up, but slower. And there's going to be a ratio between these two guys. OK. So we know the slope here is going to be slower than the slope for B. And we can check that out within our approximation. We can write at t equals 0, find out what these initial slopes are for the creation of B and C. So dB dt is the slope of the creation of B at the beginning at t equals 0. right? And that's just the rate law. dB dt t equals 0 is K1A0. And dC dt, the slope, the initial slope, t equals 0, is K1A0 squared. Or K2A0 squared, rather. Did I write K2? Yeah, K2. Make sure this is a 2 here. So I'm going to write it as K2A0 squared, like this. Well, this, we said k1 is much bigger than k2 times a0. There's the same a0 here. And so we see, just by writing this down, that our, our intuition that uh, because the rate into b is much faster than into a, that it should look like this, well, it's borne out just by this very simple sort of looking at the initial rate, where the slope here is much smaller than the slope here. OK, and then we can look at. Um, we can take the approximation in here and uh, see what it implies. So let me do that here. Let me just use my green chalk here. So k2a0 uh, is much less than k1, so this is, means this is going to go away. Um, k2a0 is much less than k1. Well, this is building up from 0, so this is always bigger than 1 here. So I can get rid of this as well, because there's the k1 sitting here, and k1 is much bigger than k2a0. Uh, once I got rid of all these two guys, then the K1s cancel out. Uh, and this is looking very nice because now I can take that e to the K1t and put it upstairs. A is equal to approximately A naught e to the minus K1 times time okay, in this approximation. It looks like it's first order coming down with a rate constant K1. It looks like... Uh, it looks like basically the branching into C is non-existent as far as, at least in this approximation, as far as A is concerned. It's going to look like this thing here. It's going to look like first order A goes to B with rate constant K1. So if you didn't know, if you didn't know that there was another substance C that was being formed along the way, if you didn't measure it, if you didn't have, do the analytical chemistry and sort of fish it out, and you just looked at the two major components, A and B, in this case here, you'd measure a rate out of A. It would look like it's first order. So great. Got my mechanism. A goes to B, period. Right? And you wouldn't know there was a minor, minor component that was being formed at the same time. OK, let's do another approximation. Let's do the other, the other case, where K2A0 is much bigger than K1. And in this case here, you have to be a little bit more careful. You have to add that you're going to look at this at early times. And we're going to see why uh, early times is important here in a little bit, in just five minutes. And early times. And how you define early times? What does it mean for? things to be close to time t equals 0. Well, we have to have a, a reference time scale. Right? The reactions are going at a certain rate. And one second may be very slow, or it may be very fast, depending on the rate of the reaction. So k1 here defines the time scale of the problem. 
It's in one over second, unit of one over second. And early times means that the times that I'm looking at compared to this rate, it's very small. Right? So K1T is less than one. Okay? That means that the time, during the time period that I'm looking at, hardly anything has happened to the branching of A to B. That, that's what I mean by early time. So B is hardly being built up yet. K1 is our reference time. K1 is units of one over a second. This has units of seconds. So it's, it's all working out fine. Otherwise, I would have no idea how to define early times. I could say it's a year. It could be, you know, if you're looking at plutonium decay, it's 100,000 year half-life. A year would be your early times. So that would be really fast compared to the, to the process, right? But if you're looking at a reaction that takes a few nanoseconds, then a year would be very, very long. So you really need your reference time somewhere in there. OK, so this approximation means that essentially no B is being created uh, while we're looking at, 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 at the process. And um, so we might then very well expect that if we look at A and C, that the answer is going to be that we're going to see something at second order. Okay? So we, we expect that uh, the, the form of A is, it, the way to write it is going to be 1 over A equals K1T plus A0, right? So let's go ahead and take our, our, our complete solution and write it in the way that we might expect the answer to be in terms of 1 over A rather than A here. So let's just invert it. E to the K1 times time, K1 plus K2A0. minus K2A0 over K1A0. This should be a minus sign here. This should be a minus sign here. It doesn't matter for, it didn't matter for our approximation because we got rid of it anyways, right? But the proper sign here is minus. OK, and so now we need to, uh, <clears throat> we need to make our approximation and figure out uh, what this is here. So if we take the approximation that K1T is small, less than 1, then what that should trigger in your mind is that if you have E to the something that's small, you should use a Taylor series and expand this into a Taylor series. So we're going to see this uh, multiple times. So we take E to the K1T and expand it out as 1 plus K1T plus et cetera. Okay, we're going we're to keep the first order terms in there. So we're going to plug this approximation into here. That's this approximation there. And then we're going to uh, expand it out. Okay, so plug in it in, in here. And uh, keeping it to first order in, um, in time and multiplying it out. And I'm not going to do the, the intermediate steps. I'm just going to give you the, the step after doing the multiplications, you get K1 Q squared. So that's basically K1 times 1 plus K1T. And then you have plus K1 K2 A0 times T. That's this term here, K1 K2 A0 times T times that. And the K2 A0 times 1 gets subtracted out from this minus K2 A0 here. So that's all we have on top. And then there, they're terms of higher order in time, but we're not going to worry about this. We're going to state to first order in time. Divide by K1 A0. And now you do your cancellations, and we have our approximation that K1 times time is much less than 1. So here we have K1 times K1 times time. So this term here means it's much less than this term here because of our approximation. So we can get rid of this term here. Get rid of that. There's no reason for us to get rid of this one here, because um, uh, we've got K2A0 there, which is much larger than K1. And uh, so when you expand this out, they, all the K1s cancel out here. So this K1 cancels out with that K1, cancel out. We have 1 plus 1, so this is basically 1 over A0, and then we have plus K2A0 time over A0. So this ends up being equal to 1 over A0 plus K2 
okay, two times time. Okay. Exactly what we expected, that if you put in the right approximation in the math, it behaves as your intuition would tell you, which is that the branching into B is essentially non-existent and that you're looking at everything going to C. Okay, it looks second order in C. But in this case here, it's only early times. So if you keep going, what happens? If you keep going in time beyond the time scale of this first order rate constant, um, and you wait long enough, then the amount of A keeps decreasing, keeps getting smaller and smaller. Right? So if you start the clock again a little bit later, where A is much smaller, then K not uh, K2 times the amount of A you have there is no longer going to be much greater than K1. Right? At some point along the, along the way, K2 times A0 is going to be much, K2 times A is going to be much less than K1. Right? So at some point along the way, it's not going to be this approximation anymore. It's going to be the previous one that we did, the one up there. So at early times, we start with something that may look second order, for A, time goes on, time goes on, time goes on, A gets depleted, A gets depleted, and the rate K2 times A, which is sitting right here, <coughs> this part here becomes smaller and smaller, and pretty soon this part wins, and it becomes first order. So what you'd expect to see then is if you were to plot as a function of A, You expect to see something that starts out as first order and, and then as A gets depleted, switches, o switches over to second order. Something that's second order here and first order. This is the concentration of A. So if you were to plot it, here you're plotting the concentration of A. If you were to plot the log of the concentration of A, at long times, you'd expect it to be first order so something linear. But at early times, you'd expect it to be second order. So you'd expect to see something that's nonlinear, then switching to something linear. Okay. And if you were to plot it as 1 over A, then you'd expect to start off with something that's linear, that's second order, early times. But instead of keeping being second order, as you deplete the amount of A, the branching into C becomes, uh, into B becomes important, and uh, you become second order. So this is second order at the beginning. And this becomes first order. Okay. So any questions here? The importance of doing this problem here was to lay out basically a systematic way of, of looking at the problems. Right? You lay out your rate, your rate equations right, like this. You solve what you can. In this case, you solve for A. And it's complicated, so you want to learn something about what the data might look like. And you look at limiting cases, two obvious limiting cases. One rate is faster than the other. You pick one, the first one first, and go through it. And then use your intuition. Every point along the way, your intuition can tell you what you expect the result to be. Right? So in this case here, our intuition told us that um, if we took the rate into B to be much faster than that in, into C, then we expected to see something that was largely first order. And when we do the approximation in our exact solution, in fact, it does look like it's first order. Right? So always use your intuition because the math is going to get pretty hairy. The algebra might, might, might get complicated, and it's really easy to make a plus sign into a minus sign somewhere along the way, like, just like I did here. So if I, if I hadn't fixed my mistake here, and I had gone and put in my Taylor series here, I would have gotten in trouble because this minus sign would have been a plus, and these K2As not, would, not, would not have canceled out, and I wouldn't have gotten the right result, which my intuition it told me it should be a second order process. Right? And so if you have a problem, 
and so you're on an exam and you doing algebra, you're trying to, and, and you, you end up with a result that doesn't match what your intuition tells you. And you don't have time to fix it. Tell us, you know. I know this is wrong because I know it's supposed to be second order, but I don't know where I went wrong. And that's really important. Okay, just tell us. That means that you're thinking. Okay. Let's get a little bit more complicated. Any questions? All right, consecutive series reactions. These were parallel reactions. And now, basically what we're doing here is build, we're building up a toolkit of simple mechanisms. And then we'll be able to put these, these mechanisms together to make something more complicated. So the next kind of mechanism, series mechanism, series reactions. So we have our, our reaction, which is A goes to C. And the mechanism that's been thought for this reaction is that, there are, that, that there's an intermediate. That first you have A goes to B, some intermediate, which gets used up to form the final product, C, with a rate K2 here. And we can either write the mechanism in two steps, or we can write it as A goes to B goes to C like this. You can see both ways of writing it. And we want to solve this. And we want to look at special cases. And we just want to understand uh, the implications of this mechanism here. So the first thing to do, just like we did before, is to write all the rate laws okay, before we get going solving anything. All right, so we start with. A minus dA dt, there's only one way that gets used up through the formation of B in a first order process. Okay, easy. This is easy to solve. We know the answer is going to be exponential in A. For B, dB dt is equal to, well, it can be formed through by first order in A, so that's K1 times A, but it also gets destroyed by forming C. So we got to get all all the paths out of A here on the right side of this equation. So it can be destroyed in a process which is first order in B. So we're going to take both K1 and K2 to be first order okay, initially. Then we'll make one of them second order, and things will become very complicated, and we'll throw up our hands. But for now, let's not throw up our hands quite yet. OK, and for D, C, D, T, there's only one way it can be formed is first order uh, by the destroying B. And we have a couple differential equations here. This uh, differential equation for C depends on B here, right? And the differential for B depends on, on A here. So that means that things are going to get a little bit more complicated. The easy one to solve is always the first one here. That's first order. So we just write out, down the answer. A is equal to A naught e to the minus k1 t. We know the answer to that one. Then we have to work on uh, b. So we want to find out integrated rate loss for every one of these uh, chemical species. Always there are tricks involved, partial fractions, whatever. So we write down B now, dB dt plus, let me rearrange it a little bit, plus K2 times B, putting the minus K2B B on the other side here, is equal to K1 times A. But I'm not going to keep this A there, because now I know what A is in terms of time, and a constant, K1 times A naught e to the minus K1 times time. OK, that's my differential equation for B. Got to solve this thing. Well, last time I said, you know, the last time I did differential equations in college was a century ago, and I wasn't, I wasn't kidding. It really was last century. In fact, it was last millennium. Um, that was a long time ago. So how do you do this? Well, the trick here, there's a trick. And the trick is to multiply the whole thing, both sides, by e to the k2t, 
and you multiply this side by e to the k2t, and you multiply this side by e to the k2t to solve this equation. So once you do that, then you have e to the k2t times db dt plus k2 times b on this side here, and then you have is equal to k1 times a naught e to the minus e to the k2 minus k1 times time. OK. So the, the reason why this tricks work is because this guy right here can be nicely written as d dt of b times e to the k2t. Right. It's a nice, simple form. So when you integrate it, it'll be very easy to integrate. Okay. And then the other side, you still have k1 a naught e to the k2 minus k1 times the time. So now you integrate both sides with respect to time. The integral of something d dt with respect to time, it's, this is just going to be itself right here. right? So it's very simple. So you integrate both sides from 0 to time dt, 0 to t dt on both sides. And on this side here, you end up with b e to the k2 times time minus b e to the k2 times 0, right? Just taking the upper limit minus the lower limit. Uh, and that's just equal to b naught at time t equals 0. And so, uh, and, and at time t equals 0, b naught is equal to 0 because we haven't made any intermediates. So this goes away. And then we have the equal sign. And on the other side, we have k1 a naught over k2 minus k1. It's just the integral of this thing here, where the k2 minus k1 goes in the denominator, e to the k2 minus k1 times time minus 1. So now you have your integral form for the amount of b that gets created at uh, any time. And I want to keep that on the board because I'm going to use it later. k1 a naught over k1 minus k2 times e to the minus k1 times time minus e to the minus k2 times time. OK, we're two thirds of the way through. Now we got to find c. And for the last component, you don't want to be doing this kind of stuff. Okay? You don't want to waste your time solving differential equations because stoichiometry can help you out. At the end of the day, you know that everything that started out as, as A in terms of quantities is going to end up at C. You know that if you end up with a concentration A naught at the beginning, at the end of the process, the concentration of C at infinite time is also going to be A naught. Right? You know that there's a, a, a correlation, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a stoichiometry that relates A and C together, and B. You have conservation of, of, of mass here, basically, the conservation of atoms that has to uh, come into play. So for C, we're just going to do algebra instead of calculus. So let's write down the stoichiometry here. The amount of C at any time is what it's going to be at the end, which is A0. The very end of the process, it's going to be a naught. Right? But before we get to the end, there's still stuff that's left in A and B. Okay? And that's going to decrease the amount of C. So minus whatever's still in A and B. That's the stoichiometry. That's one way of writing it. You could also write it in a different way, which is that the amount of C is equal to the amount of A that you have used up, A naught is what you start out, started out with. A is what's left over. So this is the amount of A used up. It's not all quite in C yet, because some of it is stuck in, is stuck in B. 
right? So it's the amount of A used up minus the amount that's stuck in B. Those two are the same, I hope. A not minus A, yeah, that's right. Minus B, yeah, that's right. Okay, so this is used up and then stuck in B. That's the hard part, putting down the stoichiometry. Once you've done the hard part, then if you solve the other two, then it's easy. You just plug in. It's just algebra. And you get something complicated. Right? C is equal to complicated. All right, it's in the notes. So I'm not going to write it down. <coughs> All right, so we solved the problem exactly. And now you're going to do an experiment. And the experiment you're going to do is not going to follow this whole thing exactly. It's going to look at, at limited cases. That's what you can do. And so the first thing to look at is to look at the initial times. The very beginning of the process, how are things appearing? Um, and then we'll look at the, at, at the, at the late times. Okay, so initial times. Near t, near t equals zero. Okay, well, every one of these things has a uh, exponential in it. And whenever we see exponentials and we look at something that it's uh, as of early times, times that are faster than one over k1 or faster than one over k2, it tells us use a Taylor series. So use the approximation e to the minus kt is approximately equal to 1 minus kt plus kt squared over 2 plus et cetera. And keep as many terms as you need in the Taylor series to get something sensible. So if everything comes out as 0 at the end, you know you haven't kept enough terms in t. Things have canceled out too much. Right? And you want something that is time dependent because it's got to change in time, right? It's a very common mistake to say only keep one here and then everything cancels out and you get zero and you say, well, b is equal to zero at all times. Right? That, that, that's nonsensical. Okay. And I don't know a priori how much time to keep. So let's, keep, let's go to second order. So if you plug this Taylor series into A, okay, and get something that's time dependent, you only need to go to first order, 1 minus k1 times time plus, et cetera. If you plug it into b, plug your Taylor series into these two guys here, you get k1 a0 over k2 minus k1. You only need to go to first order. The ones cancel out, but the times don't cancel out, minus k1 plus k2, that is unless k1 and k2 are the same. So we're making the approximation that k1 is different than k2 times the time. Then when we look at c, this complicated thing that I didn't write down, if you were to just to stop at first order in c, you get c equals 0. You know that can't be right. You know that c is it's going to increase in time. Right? It can't be equal 0 at all times. So you have to go to second order for c. And it's approximately equal to a naught times k1, k2 over 2 times the time squared. OK. Let me rewrite this a little bit closer in because I need, I need some room here. So c is approximately equal to a naught k1, k2 over 2 times the time squared. OK, now we can start plotting out what this is going to look like then. So we have the concentrations, time on the axis here. Let's start with the concentration of A. It's uh, A is dropping down linearly in time. Okay, it's dropping down linearly in time here. B is increasing uh, linearly in time at the beginning. So B is going up linearly in time like this. And C is increasing quadratically in time. So it's pretty flat coming up first. And then it starts to curve up. Okay, it's 
our first approximation. Then we go to late times, t equals infinity. All right, see t equals infinity. Where am I going to write this? Okay, let's move this up. Okay, let's go. T goes to infinity. Well, here I know that I'm, I'm allowed to go to zero, or allowed to go to a constant, because infinity is, you know, it's forever. Okay, so at t infinity, I know that I'm going to use up all of a. So I know that a is going to be equal to zero. I know I'm going to use up all of b, so I know b is going to go to zero somehow. And I know that c is going to go to a naught. Right, so c is going to go to a naught and infinity. Okay, so now on my graph here, I know that at infinity, a is going to go down to zero like this somehow, probably exponentially, because it is exponential in time, so it's going to go to zero exponentially. b is going to go down to zero exponentially. There are the exponentials right here. So b is going to go down to zero exponentially, something like this. And c is going to saturate to a naught. It's exponentially rise up to a naught. So this was a naught right here. It's going to go like this. So that I connect the dots. Right? I know that a c is going to start quadratically. And then it's going to rise up and exponent like this. I know that b is going to go start off linearly. And then it has to go to 0. So it has to go through some sort of maximum. And a is going to go down exponentially, eventually, like this. So the interesting part of this diagram is that b goes to a maximum. There's some point, there's some time that we can call t sub b max, where b is a maximum. And that's an interesting point. That's something that we could try to figure out experimentally what it is, right? And we could get some parameters. We could maybe extract some information. There is a maximum B, concentration of B, that gets formed. And how do you solve that? You set dB dt equal to 0. Right? So you have your equation for B right here. You set it equal to 0, and you solve. You get your maximum time. It's made up of rate constant. You get your maximum concentration, which is also made up of rate constants. And you can get rate constants out of this. Question? Right? Yes? Should the maximum of B be just a Or is that just a coincidence? That is a coincidence. That is my poor okay. sketching. <coughs> yeah, it should probably be somewhere like in the middle here. Actually, it completely depends on the, uh, it depends on the rates. And we're going to see limiting cases where this maximum can occur here or can occur somewhere down here. Okay. So this is, the, this is the complete case. OK, so limiting cases, the important limiting cases. Um, we made an approximation along the way that k1 is different than k2. So that has to be a case that needs to be worked out. And it's likely to be easier than the full, uh, than the full solution. So one of the limiting cases is k1 is equal to k2. And I'll leave that for homework. Okay, You can do that yourselves. It's good exercise. What about another limiting case? Well, you have two other limiting cases. One, you've got two rates. So one is bigger than the other. Okay, there's no information on this board here. You start off with one case. So k1 greater than k2. k2 
greater than K2, what does it mean? K1 greater than K2. It means that the, the rate determining step or the limiting step in this reaction is the second step. K2 is very slow compared to K1. And um, sometimes I like to think of these things as pipes and uh, connecting vessels. So let's say we have the uh, amount of liquid in the top vessel is the concentration of A. The amount of liquid in the middle vessel, let me get my color scheme to be consistent here. Then we have a middle vessel, which is the concentration of B, and the final vessel, which is the concentration of C. Okay, and we start out with some sort of amount of A in here. Right? Sorry, with a lot of A, okay? And then th these vessels are connecting with pipes. So there's a very thick, big pipe that connects A and B together. The rate is fast, going to A to B. And the rate going from B to C is slow, so there's a skinny pipe connecting B and C together. And then. I turn on the system, I set time to equal zero, poof, what happens? This is a big pipe connecting A and B. The whole amount of A here gets transferred to B, suddenly. And then it gets stuck here, and then it dribbles out from B to C. So what do we expect if we were to plot our, our, uh, our quantities as a function of time? What we'd expect then, then we're gonna make sure that the math works out, is that well, A is going to decrease really fast, right? It's going to go poof, right? First order, in, uh, first order in time with a very fast rate. And all of this is going to go straight into B. So we expect B to go linearly. Remember, at the beginning, it's linear. Linear goes up almost all the way up to A0, because right? it can't hardly get out. Reaches its maximum, then it goes from B to C through this skinny, skinny pipe. First order rate with the rate K2. So we're exponentially going down slowly, slowly, slowly with the rate K2. And then C starts quadratically. And then very quickly, once, once everything's into B, A is a, it's forgotten. A doesn't matter anymore. Basically, what you're looking at is the transfer of B and to C through, these, through this little pipe. And you know that's going to be a first order rate, first order process, B to C's first order process with rate K2. So you expect then C to go up in a first order process to A naught with rate K2. There's the rate K2 here and the rate K1 here. So when you turn the crank on your approximation in the math, what you better see is that at the end, B as a function of, of time should look like a first order process with rate K2. C as a function of time should look, look like a first order process with rate K2 going to A naught. And you can write the answer. You should be able to write the answer for C. It's gonna be C is approximately it's going to go to A naught. There's no other choice, right? Everything that was in A gets transferred to B naught. So at timing is infinity, it's going to be A naught. And it's going to be a first order process with rate K2, 1 minus E to the minus K2 times times. Right? I don't even have to do the math. I know that's the answer. If you don't believe me, then do the math. Okay? You should do it. But that's the answer. It has to be the answer. And if you look at B, The answer has to be that it's approximately looking like B is disappearing um, with a rate constant that's K2, e to the minus K2. And the maximum here is very close to A0. So I'm going to be putting A0 here, close enough. So as long as I ignore the very initial time where A suddenly dumps into B, then everything after that very early time here is just looking like B goes to C. This is not zero, this is t. And 
and a just disappears quickly, and we can write it as a is equal to a naught e to the minus k1 times the time. That's an easy approximation. And you just got to make sure that, that uh, this fits. So the other limiting case, which I'm also going to leave as a homework because it's so straightforward, is to have k2 greater than k1. And you should make sure that you can predict it and that you can, that the math works out. Okay, any questions? Next time we'll do reversible reactions and uh, more approximations.